Amen. Let's get a Lord a hand. Praise God. It's a beautiful energy. Me and my wife was, uh, we was driving here saying, man, I hope we have worship today. <laughs> Amen. Let me just do a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, the Lord, we just, we give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to come on a Saturday night, spend time in your presence. We ask for your presence and anointing to be with us on tonight, oh God. We ask that you bless the message. I ask, oh God, that you bless everyone who hears this message. I pray, oh God, that the, the seed, oh God, from this word is planted in the people's hearts that roots a, a bountiful harvest, oh God, that brings you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. You know, got my freestyle on. I have to do that once every seven, eight years. Uh, so this week, uh, a lot of tests and challenges. Uh, one good thing, uh, my daughter finished uh, her school on this week. She graduated with a B plus average. Um, I was very grateful. So to show her my gratitude, I asked her, you know, so where you where you want to go? You know, where you want to go eat? Pick any place you want to go, right? And uh, you know what my daughter said? She said, I want to go to Crispy Crunchy Chicken. <laughs> hey Amen. Anybody know about this place? Yeah, it's, uh, it's not, not easy to find. It's actually, it's in the gas station. Yeah, anybody have a gas station chicken? Uh, so... You know, she got this from my wife. This is actually my wife's, like, favorite chicken place. I still haven't tasted the chicken. I refuse. <laughs> I got standards, man. I, I grew up eating food from the liquor store. I know how this go, right? And uh, you ain't reinventing the wheel. It's the same chicken. You know what I'm saying? Look, so... <laughs> you know, so... So I, I, I actually like gave her a, a lecture. I said, man, you got to be careful eating this stuff. We don't know, you know, is this stuff inspected by the Food and Drug Administration? We don't know, right? So she actually got, she got irritated. And I, I, I told her, I said, hey, uh, don't get irritated yet. We ain't got there. <laughs> we ain't got there, right? So... We, we get there, we get to the chicken place, and uh, it's flies, and you know, it's the guy behind the thing, he ain't got no hair net, he ain't got no gloves on, you know, I'm looking like, I know this dude ain't washed his hands, you know, but she was happy though, so she got the fish, you know what, it wasn't cheap. Gas station food supposed to be cheap. You know, when she get the pizza from 7-Eleven, it's like $3 for two slices. You know how much two pieces of fish was? It's like $11 for two pieces. Right. That's what I'm like. I was in there. I was offended. I'm like, man, this is the gas station. Why are we paying these, paying these kind of prices? We can go somewhere and get some. But praise God, you know. <laughs> She, uh, you know, it's funny because she wasn't raised in the ghetto, you know what I'm saying? But uh, I guess she still got a little ghetto in her. I guess it's still, you know, it's hard. Because that's, that's ghetto. If you don't, if you ain't never been to the ghetto, right, you from Fremont or someplace, go to Crispy Crunchy Chicken and get a little taste of the hood. I don't mean to be advertising. They're not paying me, I'm just saying I'm, you know, I'm serious. <laughs> so, praise God. You know, for the new people, my name is Elder Jeremiah. Um, and this, my wife, is Elder Janina. Uh, we actually, we got 
married, we met each other here at the church uh, what, eight years ago? Nine years? Nine years. Amen. And, uh, you know, we had a, uh, there's a whole testimony about how, uh, how God put us together. You know, uh, basically, um, God told my wife, God told Pastor Eugene, God told other people in the church, but God didn't tell me. You know, I was the last one to get the message, so I had to go through a process to figure out that she was the person I was supposed to be married to. You know, I got, I got uh, some baggage and stuff, you know, drama that I've been through, so it wasn't easy for me to come to that place, right? Get married by faith, it's a different type of thing, you know? So, um, in the process, as I'm praying, and this is important for when you get instructions from the pastors, and you praying by yourself, but the pastors is praying with you. That elevates stuff to a whole different level. God was answering prayers so quickly in this time. So, I was telling my wife uh, this uh, when I finally uh, uh, figured out, okay, that I wasn't supposed to be uh, uh, searching. So I got the word that I was supposed to be married, and I started to think, who could, you know, who could it possibly be? And I'm praying, I'm looking around, and I had, uh, you know, several people in my mind, right? So um, at, this, at this one point, I wasn't sure, right? So I tried to hang out with this one person, right? And... We were uh, over, uh, hanging out by the water, just talking, right? And um, this is, you know, God was all in the midst of this, right? So I'm sitting there talking, and I could see, uh, you know, she had a lot of makeup, right? And I could see, like, a little bump right here, you know? I didn't think anything about it, but, you know, at some point I did, like, kind of graze my hand, because I was just curious, <laughs> right? And I realized that wasn't a bump. It was hair, right? And so I, you know, I was like, that's interesting, right? And so, you know, I kind of made it seem like an accident. I did it again, just kind of grazed, right? And I said, oh, my God, this girl got a beard. This is a true story. She had a beard. So she had on this thick makeup, right, that I had always seen her. So I never noticed until I got a little closer and I see Grace that the makeup was covering. She had a whole, like, after five thing going on, right? And I was like, oh, Lord, this ain't the one. I said, I, I didn't. I'd have been deceived. This ain't the one. I'd have messed up. Right? And so I'm sitting there and I'm already thinking, all right, I gotta, I gotta figure out how to cut this off. We gotta go. And so I get a text, right? I get a text from my brother-in-law. And this is this is so true, right? The text says, What are you doing? It's like quit playing and go home. It's like quit messing around and go home. And I'm looking at the text and I'm thinking, don't nobody know where I'm at right now. What is happening, right? And somehow it was a group text, and the next thing you know, my mama responded to the group text and was like, Jeremiah, where you at? You okay? And I'm sitting in the car, and I was like, what is happening right now, right? So I'm convicted at this point, and I'm thinking this is God telling me, hey, you need to get out of here, right? So I told her, you know, I got to go. And I uh, dropped her off right at her car, and I'm driving home. And I'm, as I'm driving home, it's like not much traffic on the freeway. And then the police gets in front of me. And I don't know if you guys ever been behind the police when they stop the traffic, but they start doing this weaving thing across the whole freeway. You know, I don't know if you guys ever seen this, right? And it forced everybody to like slow down. And I'm like, it's, it's, this Escalade, and then it's like me, and it's a couple other cars behind me, and I slow down behind the police, right? And so the Escalade is trying 
to go past the police because, you know, he's bobbing like this. So when the police go to this side of the freeway, he's trying to speed up and go past. This is the angriest police officer I've ever seen, right? So the police officer speeds up in front of the guy, and there's two police officers in the car, right? The police officer on the passenger side, the guy slows down to like, you know, five miles an hour, right? Police officer opens the door, jumps out of a moving car in front of the Cadillac and was like, stop! Right? And I'm sitting in my car behind and I'm looking like, because I'm thinking, like, this is God telling me, but he cut it out, right? Because this is everybody in the church is praying, and I'm out trying to figure this out, and I, and I took that. So that was the last time uh, uh, I tried to go hang out with a friend. And I took that, like, serious. Like, God was telling me, you better cut it out. I took that as God in that police car, when he slowed down the police, and he was, like, basically saying, telling me, you're trying to get ahead of me. Right? And he's like, cut it out. You're going to get yourself into trouble. Right? Just slow down and wait on me. And that was, um, and I listened. I obeyed. Amen? So, that was one of the stories, like, you know, involved in, uh, 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 and there's a lot of stories, right? Me and my wife, before we got married. Praise God. So, like I said, it was a lot of tests this week, and um, you know, my main test this week was my son, Joel. I had to repent this week, y'all, um, and just tell you the truth. So, I, uh, you know, I work nights, and I got off work, 6.30, come home, 7 a.m., and Miss Liz had to leave. You know, Miss Liz helps us with Joel a lot, actually. She watches him, like, more than anybody in the house. And I get home at 7 o'clock or so, and I slept, like, maybe two hours. And I come downstairs, and Miss Liz is gone, and Sayla is watching Joel. And she, uh, uh, Sayla, like, immediately disappeared, right? So I'm, like, dead tired, and I'm watching Joel. And, you know, Joel is just, like, just bouncing, right? He's just bouncing off walls and he's just, right? So after a couple hours of this, um, uh, he starts like crying, right? He starts whining and I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with him. And I said, oh, maybe he's hungry, right? I try to go make him a sandwich. <clears throat> so I open the drawer to get the knife and Joel's like right behind me. And as I'm closing the drawer, he's trying to stick his hand in there and I smash his hand in the drawer, right? So I'm like, ah, right? And he's crying, right? Because it's really got him. And I'm mad because I hurt my son's hand. And I'm mad because I'm feeling myself getting stirred up, right? So I'm mad at myself too, right? And uh, he didn't stop crying from, from that point on, right? He's crying. Next thing I know, he runs across the room. He pulls out a chair. He stubbed his toe on the chair. He's screaming some more. Right, and I'm just getting more, I'm like, ah, right, I'm just getting more and more stirred up, right? So, I finally, at some point, I said, it's nap time. I said, you going to sleep, it's, this is the wrap. And normally, I just let him put himself to sleep, right? But this time, I said, no, nah, right? So, I lay down, and I made him, him lay down, and we wrestled for, it seemed like, 45 minutes. He's just wrestling, he's fighting, he's screaming, he's trying to get up. And I'm like, uh-uh. I'm like, you down for the count, right? So he finally gets to sleep. My wife comes home. We have to run an errand. And she asks me how I'm doing, right? And I'm like, not good. Like, I'm like, it's not good right now, right? I'm tired, right? So we went to pick up a computer. And we said, oh, you know, we're going to pick up some food, right? And we go parked and we at the place to get the food and I pick Joe up again right and we're standing in front of the place trying to decide what we're going to eat and, and Joe's like bow right and slaps my face and knocked the glasses off I said oh that's it <laughs> boy if you don't get away from me I was, 
I had to stay away. I had to give them to my wife because I was, I was just so done. Trying. I was done. We, got, we didn't eat. I fasted that day. We went home. I went up to my room. I had to go tell God I was sorry. I had to pray. But I stayed in the room until it was time to go to work. I was done. Right? So, uh, man, life, you know what I'm saying? Kiss is a blessing, but it's, it's definitely it's a test, you know? So, one of the things that I want to mention uh, last week is that Pastor was talking about King Ahab, right? And one of the things that I noticed about King Ahab that I meant to say last week, but I like overthought it when I was doing the prayer because it was Sunday and I was like, I didn't want to, you know, pray too long. I just want to pray so people can eat and we can go home. I didn't want to be that guy, you know. So what I noticed about King Ahab is that when, you know, Pastor talked about he was like the wickedest king, right, of Israel. And God kept giving him victory and kept giving him grace. Um, but at the end of his reign, there was a point when the prophet comes up to him and the prophet has somebody like strike him and he comes up to Ahab and he asks him like this scenario, right? And Ahab judged the person that he thought he was asking him about and then the prophet flipped in him and he said, oh no, this is about you. And he said, you are the person, right? And so what God did is he judged Ahab out of his own mouth, right? And I was thinking about this because when Pastor was talking, like, this is a pattern that's repeated several times in the Bible, right? If you know the story of David when he slept with Bathsheba, right, uh, the prophet did the same thing. He approached him and he asked him, he told him a story about a guy who had some sheep, but instead of using his own sheep, he went and took the one sheep from somebody else, right, to feed the people who was coming to his house. And David judged the guy thinking it was for somebody else. And the prophet flipped in and said, oh, no, this is about you, right? And David said, you're right, I've sinned, right? And so God has this pattern of judging people out of their own mouth, if you think about the children of Israel when they're in the wilderness and they're complaining, at some point God says, I'm going to judge you out of your own mouth, right? I'm going to take a kiss into the promised land and y'all going to die out here in the wilderness. Amen? I'm just going through these so you guys can see like this pattern is repeated a lot, right? If you remember the story of uh, uh, Jesus who gives his servants the talents, he has one, he gives five, one he gives two, one he gives one, Right? To the one with the one, he said, my master is a hard master. And Jesus said, by your own words, I'm going to judge you, right? Judge them out of his own mouth. If you look at uh, uh, even Aaron and Moses, I mean, Aaron and Miriam, right? I don't know what specifically they said, but whatever they said about Moses crossed the line and God showed up, right? So this week, it was, I was thinking, right, we have to be very careful about what we say. You guys know why I was thinking about this all week is because God's done this to me uh, several times, right? So basically, the week before last, I was having a conversation with my wife, and I was complaining to her about why can't God do things this way, Right? Why doesn't he save these people? Why doesn't he do this, right? And I, I know you guys may not be paying attention, but before Pastor preached on uh, Sunday, he came in and he just started talking down here. He wasn't even on the podium, right? And as he's talking, I'm thinking, and my wife is thinking, right? Because he's speaking directly to what I was saying, right? And he basically gave us a scenario about... Um, when the disciples were in the boat and Jesus sent them ahead, right? And they was freaking out in the boat. And Pastor was saying, like, Jesus told them he was going to get them to the other side, right? 
I don't know who was listening, but that word was like directly for me, right? Basically, I was complaining because uh, I was doubting God about some things. And God reaffirmed. It's like, hey, I've already given you a word. You need to just stay hanging on to that word. You need to believe that word, right? And it's coming out of Pastor's mouth, right? So uh, me and my wife talked about it. We drive home, and it's like, you heard what Pastor said? She's like, yep. Right? She's like, you remember we were talking about? It's like, yep. That was God. That was for you, right? Yep. Right? So I'm listening, right? You have to be open, right? And, and, and uh, paying attention so you can catch that, right? God is listening to your words. God is listening to your conversations, whether it's here, whether it's at home. God is paying attention. Even this week, right? I told you about all my problems with Joel, right? And I'm at work uh, uh, last night, but my wife calls said, as soon as she walked into church, pack a walk up, pastor walk up to her and say, so you know why God gave you Joel, right? And she's looking at pastor like, how you know? <laughs> right? And she called me at work like, Pastor walked up to me and started talking to me about Joe and was telling me. And I was like, man, like God is all up in the business. Amen? But like I said, I believe like you got to be open so that you can catch that, right? Can we get uh, Malachi 313 um, NLT? Sorry, I didn't send the scriptures because I was, I was busy freestyling and rapping. I'll just start reading before, as they bring this up. And I'm going to read down to... I can't see it's too small. So it says, and this is God speaking. You have said terrible things about me, says the Lord. But you say, what do you mean? What have we said against you? Right? This is God speaking to Israel. And Israel's like, what are you talking about, God? What did we say? This is God is listening. Amen? He says, you have said, what's the use of serving God? What have we gained by obeying the commandments or by trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we are sorry for our sins? From now on, we will call the arrogant blessed. For those who do evil get rich and those who dare God to punish them suffer no harm. It says, then those who feared the Lord. So this is a different group of people. Right? So this is one group of people that's at home basically saying God is not just. Right? They're talking about God saying that he's not fair, basically. God blesses sinners and doesn't bless them, basically is what they're saying. Right? And then there's a different group of people. Right? And it says these are the people who feared the Lord. Right? And it says, then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other and the Lord listened to what they said. So the Lord is listening to both groups of people. Amen? Both the people who fear God and the people who don't fear God. Amen? And it said, in his presence, a scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about the honor of his name. So not only is he listening, but he has a place where he's writing down the people who speak reverently about him when they're at home and when they're in private. God is paying attention, right? We are the temple of God, not just when you're at church. You're still the temple of God when you're at work and when you're at home and when you're having a good day and when you're having a bad day. And if you're the temple of God, then the presence of God is there. And if the presence of God is there, you have to respect the presence of God at all times. Amen. And God is keeping a written record of the people who do this. Amen. And God says. A scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who fear him and always thought about the honor of his name. 
They will be my people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked because those who serve God, between those who serve God and those who do not. So God will let this scenario play out. He will let these two groups of people exist together until he decides to judge. And then you're going to see the difference. And from our perspective, because this happens in private, we may not understand why God is honoring one group of people over another group of people. But this is one of the reasons we have to be careful because everything counts. It's not just how you act at church and come to church and act holy and look sanctified in front of everybody. God is paying attention to how you act and what you say at home and outside of church and, and wherever you go. Amen. So this hit me because I, I told you I come here and pastor is answering my private conversation with my wife. Right. So I'm like, God is listening. Right. So this is not just for you. This is for me. I'm reminding myself and I'm reminding everybody. Right. Because, you know, those days of judgment come unexpectedly. And just because it's judgment don't mean it's bad. It just means a day where God decides to act. And we'll have a day where somebody is getting raised up or somebody is getting taken down. It could go either way. Right. And a lot of times we're scratching our heads because it's like we don't understand what God is doing, right? But there is a, 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 a whole backside to, to, uh, to God's decisions that a lot of times we don't know because we only know the surface. Amen? So, like I said, we have to be very careful. I just showed you how God judged kings out of their own mouth and the low people. This applies to everybody in multiple places in the Bible, right? I, I, I mentioned, um, we all know the story of um, Aaron and Moses when God called them to the front of the tabernacle because they were at home talking about Moses and they crossed the line someplace and God was not playing and Miriam got struck with leprosy. Amen? God is very serious about our words. So I was thinking about this all week because, you know, pastors has been teaching us we have to do our confessions, right? We're confessing these positive declarations, right? And this plays into that, right? You want to be in the habit of saying good things about God. You want to be in the habit of saying good things out of your mouth, Right. Because it only takes you don't know the word that God's going to pick out and be like, OK, that's the word. I'm going to make this happen in your life. Right. So you want to be in the habit every day. Right. Of saying these declarations. Right. I will go where you want me to go. I will do whatever you want me to do. I hope you guys are saying that this week. Right. I was saying it. Me and my wife was talking about it. And um, basically. in thinking about that, it's basically saying you surrender. And that kind of played into my prayer this week. I was basically just praying to God, telling God, you know, I surrender. Especially as I'm getting stirred up with my son, right? It's like you come before God with that. And it's like, what can you say, right? Except God, I surrender, right? And when, when you come to God with that kind of attitude, it's like when you surrender before God and you bring before God everything, right? Both the good and the bad about yourself. You know what I'm saying? So, um, like I said, that helped me. That helped me this week because uh, it allowed me, it humbled me um, as I was coming to God and surrendering myself to God and, and, and just having that, that state of mind, right? We want to live like that all the time. We want to live in a, in a place of surrender, right? Right? So, you know, at our church, we talk a lot about obedience to authority. And, and I talked last week about 
flowing with God. I talk a lot about, last week I talked about how um, I thought I could pray my way to heaven. And I realized it don't work like that. And your prayer and your, your good acts could become works, right? Um, so I wanted to elaborate a little bit on that um, as what it takes to flow with God, right? It's not just about obedience to the letter of the law like they tried in the Old Testament, right? We want to flow in the will of God. Amen? So, for me, right, in my experience, you know, I worked in a hospital for 20, 24 years. 24 years working in hospitals, basically, with that, with that one break where I drove Uber for, those, for that period of time, right? And so my experience, right, is that to flow with a person, right, where, where you guys are come to this place where you're like one and there's things that don't have to be said because you know each other that well, that takes a lot of time. I used to work in... Uh, an MRI with a set of doctors and and I worked with this group of doctors for over a decade and I remember getting to a place where they would always request me even though I may not have been the most qualified person because I had done it so long I knew every doctor I knew what they wanted before they walked in the room I know each doctor's likes and dislikes I know their idiosyncrasies and they know me. They know what I'm able to help with. They know what I'm not able to help with. So when the uh, patient's on the table, right, we don't have to have this discussion. Because there's times, you know, in a hospital where it's not really time to talk, right? When somebody stops breathing, you got you to gotta act. You know, when you're working on a, uh, an adult person can actually not breathe for like 10 minutes. And your brain can handle that. But when you're dealing with somebody the size of Joe, you got like one minute right? You don't have a lot of time. So it's not time to talk and try to explain to somebody, okay, you're going to do this part and I'm going to do this part and we're going to, you know what I'm saying? You got to just flow. You got to flow quickly, right? And like I said, I worked in this capacity with them for a long time and now I'm at a different hospital and I'm kind of on the outside looking in because the people who've been at this hospital I'm at for 20 years they know everything about the facility and everything about the doctors. And I understand the place that they're at, but I'm not there. Even though I know my job, right, I'm not flowing with them like that, right, because I haven't spent that kind of time with them, right? Flowing with somebody takes time, and you guys got to really, like, know each other. I believe it's God's will, right, for us to get to a place where it's not about uh, necessarily, like I said, obedience to the law, but where we spend enough time with God, where we can flow with God, right? Where he knows us and we know him. And it's ne not necessarily that we're going to be perfect because as humans, we're not going to be perfect, but we have a close enough relationship, right, to where we can be used by God and, and there's no breaks in the anointing because we're not flowing. You know what I'm saying? So, at least for me, you know, that's my understanding of, you know, what it takes to flow. I believe it takes, like, it takes, like, a lot of time. You know, like I said, if we are temples, right, and the Holy Spirit dwells in us, we want to get to the place, right, where we're flowing. Even just up here while we're freestyling, right, I was thinking, I know there's an anointing here, right, but it's difficult, right, to flow in that anointing to where your words can catch up and you can just, and you can just keep flowing on, right? People start out good and all of a sudden there's breaks and all of a sudden it's like, uh, I, you, you know, you don't know what to say next and this and that, right? That takes time, right? That takes work and that takes not only work on your part, but working with God for a period of time. Amen? I believe one day we're going to have the anointing to freestyle and it's going to be as good as, you know, somebody who's already practiced and written and written their raps. Amen? 
Can we get uh, Ezekiel 47 and 1? And so basically, Ezekiel 47 and 1. And this is um, a part of Ezekiel where God is taking him around his temple and he's showing him uh, uh, how the temple was built. And I just want to read from this a little bit. Um, I just want to, can you bring up the whole 47 and I'm going to read down. Matter of fact, just bring up the whole 47. And it says, in my vision, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. There I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple and passing to the right of the altar on its south side. The man brought me outside the wall through the north gateway and led me around to the eastern entrance. There I could see the water flowing out through the south side of the east gateway. Let me move up some. Measuring as he went, he took me along the stream for 1,750 feet, and then he led me across. The water was up to my ankles. He measured off another 1,750 feet and led me across again. This time, the water was up to my knees. After another 1,750 feet, it was up to my waist. Then he measured another 1,750 feet, and the river was too deep to walk across. It was deep enough to swim in, but not too deep to walk, but too deep to walk through. So basically, this water is flowing out from the presence of God. And this water represents God's grace for us, right? So uh, like I was saying about thinking I could pray my way through, and God is like, no, you need to obey, and you need to flow with my authority, right? Because this grace is flowing down from God's throne, right? And this water represents the grace of God, and this angel is showing Ezekiel the different levels of grace. It's different levels of grace, amen? We want to spend time with God so that we can flow in increasing higher levels of grace. We always talk about we want to go from glory to glory. If you're going to go from glory to glory, you're going to have to walk in increasing higher levels of grace because it's not by works, it's not by your own strength that you're going to accomplish anything for God. It's all by his grace. Amen? So, the angel is showing him these levels, right? And like I said before, when I first started, how pastor has us doing these confessions, right? I will go where you want to go. I will do what you want to do. And I said, for me, right, the core of that is surrender, right? So in order for us, right, to flow in deeper levels of grace, we have to surrender. We have to work at surrendering more to God, right? There's levels of grace that correlate to the level you are surrendered to God. Amen? So, and I'm thinking about this all week, right? As I'm getting stirred up at Joel, I know in my heart I have to surrender my anger. Right? I have to surrender more in that, area, in that area. Amen? We have to surrender our pride. We have to, we have to surrender uh, uh, our works. Right? We are, basically I said last week that your prayer could become works. Right? And when we think that we are accomplishing something because we are striving so hard by our own effort, right? This puts us under the law, right? How do you know if you're under the law 
or if you're under grace. If you're under grace, when somebody offends you, when somebody pushes you to your limit, you're going to be able to give them grace if you're under grace. If you're under grace, you're going to have grace to give somebody else. If you're under the law, you're going to retaliate because the law says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Right? That's the whole premise of the law. Right? Everything equal. Right? You hit me, I hit you. You hate me, I hate you back. Right? That's the law. And so when you're in your test, right, and you come to that place where somebody hurts you or does something to you and you have to get back at them, you can't forgive them, that's letting you know, right, you still got some law in you. Right? We have to come to the place where we surrender more and more when we encounter these tests and God shows us. Right? Because... Just because we're saved and we all have grace, we're at different levels of grace because we're at different levels of surrender. And somebody can take a whole lot more and still give grace than somebody else. And that person who can give a lot more grace, right, is going to be flowing with God to a higher degree. And as they flow, they're going to be able, right, to, show, to produce fruit. And to produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, meekness, self-control. They're going to have it. It's going to be natural for them because it's not coming from them. It's because they're flowing with God. Amen. So for us, this is a lifelong process. We may come to the church or you come to God and you get prayed for, right? You get saved. And there is grace. But like, like the angel showed Ezekiel, that's the first level is only ankle deep, right? And ankle deep, that's not gonna, that's not gonna do a whole lot, right? If you in if you in ankle deep water, you can run in any direction you want to. You can do whatever you want to, right? It's not, it's going to be difficult probably to even discern a lot of things. But when you make it to that next level and it's ankle deep and this is a current, I don't know if you guys ever been in moving water, it's going to be pulling you in a certain direction, right? If you flow with God up to a certain level, the pull, right, or the flow, that flow is going to be pushing you in certain directions, right? So you're not always going to be able to react like you want to because God is going to be pushing you to forgive. He's going to be pushing you to love. He's going to be pushing you, right, to help people, right? So as we continue, right, to die to ourselves, as we continue to surrender more, and we're fighting to surrender, right, because we come full of idols, right? We come to God full of fear. We come to God full of hate. We come to God full of uh, uh, anger, right? We come to God just full of all this stuff, right? So God begins to uh, uh, his assault on our heart as we surrender and as we spend time with God and, and growing in our relationship with God, he begins to take up more and more of our hearts, Right, And as we surrender more and more of our hearts to God, uh, this grace, it will, we will have it. We will have this grace. Right? And as we do possess more of his grace, the fruit that pleases God, we will naturally produce it. We won't have to strive. Amen? So one point I want to make is that, you know, I know we talk a lot about like spiritual warfare and, and Christians talk a lot about, you know, this war that we're in. And that part is true. But we're not necessarily fighting the devil directly like that because we can't. These, these beings are actually stronger than us. 
Without the grace of God, we have no chance. How are we going to fight in a war you can't even see what you're fighting? We can't see these spirits. We can't see, right, what's going on and the traps that they have set for us, right? What we're really fighting is to surrender. And as you surrender and grace comes to you, the grace of God is what's actually winning the war. The grace of God is what's giving you the victory over the enemy. Amen? The grace of God is what's actually helping you pass your test with God so that you can go higher. Amen? Can we get uh, Proverbs chapter 3 and 5 and 6? And this is scripture that we all know. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do. And he will show you the right path to take. So basically, I brought the scripture up because, you know, flowing with God. Oh, wow. Flowing with God takes faith. Right? So, the difference between flowing in the grace of God and works, right? Trying to do stuff by your own effort is flowing, even though obedience is required in both, right? Whether it's obedience to the law, right? Obedience to the spirit, right? Which is flowing through your authority, Obedience is required in both camps, but one obedience requires faith. One obedience, obedience to the law is just based purely on what you naturally know, purely on your own strength that you have in your body, purely on your own cunningness. But what God is pleased with, because the Bible says it's impossible to please God without faith. Right? So God is going to ask you to do something that requires faith. That's what you have to obey. You're going to have to obey something that you think is impossible. Right? When God asked them to go into the promised land, the reason they didn't obey is because they didn't believe God was going to take care of them. Right? They didn't have the faith to think God was going to fight giants. It wasn't that they didn't understand the instruction. They understood clearly what Moses wanted them to do, right? But they didn't believe, right? So for us, you know, there's, there's a level that everybody can obey because you understand the instruction. God is not asking us to do something too difficult, but he may ask you to do something that requires faith, right? And if you don't have the faith to trust God that he's going to take care of you, then you're not going to obey God, right? And that's the obedience that's going to help you flow, amen, with God. Can we get uh, Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 12? And this scripture I want to bring up because a lot of what God asks us to do, it's not that it's complicated, but it can be very difficult, right? Um, It says, two people are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. It says, likewise, Two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated. Two can stand back to back and conquer. They are even, they are, three are even better for a three, triple braided cord is not easily broken, right? And I brought this scripture up because for me, in my low period, when I was trying to just hang on to God with everything I had, You know, sometimes the grace that God gives you is another person. 
right? And with this other person, you can stand. And sometimes, because these seasons are long, right? This is not, I'm talking about just one event that's a test. Sometimes you could be in a season, right? And this goes on for years, right? Before I came here, I was in an extreme test for years. When I was in Vallejo and I got three kids and I'm by myself and this is for years. I'm alone, right? And my only consolation, right, or a lot of the consolation I got was when I would meet other people and their testimonies, they've been through difficult trials that they could understand the level of difficulty I was in. That consoled me, right? And even now when I go through difficulties, a lot of days, it not, it's not necessarily something supernaturally happened, but it's just the fact that my wife is in it with me and we're in it together gives me strength to stand, right? So I'm not saying that the supernatural part is not good, and I get, I get a lot of that too, the supernatural thing. Sometimes God hits me in a certain place and he just turned my whole world around. But there are times when that person that either through what they say or being with you, that's grace also. And that grace can help you stand to make it through your test. Amen? So... Can we get 2 Corinthians 6 and then 6 and 7? And it says that we prove ourselves by our purity. And this is NLT, right? And it says we prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love, we faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and in the left hand for defense. So Paul is talking about our weapons of righteousness, right? So when I was talking about uh, surrendering to God, surrendering to his peace, right? Surrendering to his love, surrendering to his mercy, these are also weapons, right? Because when we encounter people of the world, we need these kind of weapons. Jesus overcame hate with love. He overcame evil with good. Amen? This grace that's flowing from God, that's allowing us to overcome, these are actually spiritual weapons, right, that we can use in our battle against the enemy. Amen? Amen? Can we get uh, 2 Corinthians 10 and 3 through 4 NLT? And you guys know the scripture, and it says, We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasons and destroy false arguments, right? So in this scripture... He's saying that we use our spiritual weapons, right, to attack the human reasoning uh, that's going on in our minds and destroy false arguments. So <clears throat> this is two different wars we're talking about here. We all have an internal war and we have an external war, right? The grace of God is needed for both of these wars, right? For the internal struggle that we go through in your mind, because the enemy is constantly attacking your mind, trying to make you doubt, trying to make you fear, trying to make you blow up, trying to make you whatever, right? And God is helping you with this. And then at the same time, we have this external war, right, that we're using also weapons of righteousness to win also, right? That Paul says we have uh, weapons Righteous weapons in our right hand for attack and in the left hand weapons for defense. Amen. So this uh, all goes back to uh, us flowing in the grace of God. Right. And us getting the victory so we can move forward. Us uh, glorifying God. Right. Because in order to give God the glory, we're going to have to overcome some stuff. Right. It's not it's not going to be easy. Right. You read the Bible. They, they fought a lot of very serious battles, right? And that's to teach us, right, that 
We're going to have to fight too. It's not going to come easy. God's not going to give it to you for free. We all know it's going to be a price. Amen. But as we surrender to God and as we flow in the grace of God, uh, we will become strong in these areas. Amen. We have to be careful as we surrender because if the old man comes up, you're going to want to fight carnally. You're going to want to fight with physical weapons. You're going to want to, you're going to, want to cuss somebody, right? You're going to want to hit somebody. You're going to want to act out of character. You're going to want to uh, go back to your flesh. Amen. But we got to stay in the spirit. And we have to constantly remind ourselves because this is all in this invisible realm because nobody can see their thoughts, right? And we can't see these weapons Paul is talking about. But you'll just see the effect that the weapons are having. Amen. Okay, and um, I'm getting close to time. So uh, just on a, one thing I wanted to touch on um, that kind of dropped in my spirit not too long ago. And we all know that uh, Jesus was born in a manger, right? Jesus was born uh, in a barn with the animals, right? And it's like, yes, he was humble, right? And that's why it was okay but there's also a, a reason why God allowed him to be born in a manger, right? If you, if you think about it, God is, everything God does, there's a purpose, right? Everything God does, there's a, a, a reason, right? So when Jesus came to the earth, he came as a sacrifice for the world. He came as the Lamb of God, right? So when you're looking at him in a manger, you're looking at the lamb. God is sending a message. He's saying, this is the lamb of God, right? It's not just that through circumstances, they couldn't get a hotel room because God doesn't make mistakes, especially not with Jesus, right? God is sending us a message, right? That this is the lamb of God coming into the world. And his, one of his whole purposes, right, is to be the sacrifice and take away the sins of the world, right? So I just want to touch on that because, you know, I've, I've heard it said a lot of times about uh, uh, Jesus being a manger, but I've never heard that angle. And when God dropped that on me, I was like, oh, wow, praise God, right? So for us to understand that God is doing everything for a reason, amen? And God put him in a manger uh, uh, to teach us, right, or to show us that this is his message, that he is the Lamb of God. Amen? To take away the sins of the world. And as Jesus uh, dies on the cross, one last point. It's a scripture in the Bible that says, you know, love covers a multitude of sin, right? And we know that as Christians, we need to cover each other. When people sin against you and people make mistakes, right? Uh, we need to love people, right? When they come against you. But if you look at the cross, um, when Jesus died on the cross, he is covering the sins of the world, right? Jesus is love, right? If he is love and love covers sin, then Jesus has to act this out, right? Jesus is illustrating this with his life. So from beginning to end, he comes into the world as the Lamb of God, right? And dies on the cross and covers the sins of the world. Amen? Because he is love and he's showing us, right, how to die to ourselves to cover sin. Amen? So, you know, like I was saying, there's a lot of tests. You know, we're all going through stuff. Remember that God is listening to everything that's being said, even in your private conversations. So you want to be open when pastor's preaching, right, and when things are being said, because God could be speaking and responding to you. Amen? And also, uh, you want to remember that you want to fight to surrender. You want to fight because when you're surrendering, you're surrendering to the grace of God 
And this grace of God is what's going to take you to your victory. This grace of God is how you're going to get your breakthrough. This grace of God is how you're going to glorify God. Because it's all by his grace. But our battle is to surrender. Amen? Amen. I think that's it. All right. Thank you, Lord.